he told me that he was divorced. He wanted to marry me. He told me that he'd once worked for a private equity firm, that he had a ridiculous amount of money. He told me he was an orphan. He said he had been in the SAS and was awarded the Purple Heart. He said he'd killed people in battle. He was such a good polo player. He knew race car drivers. So many, so many things. He told me he couldn't imagine his future without me. So he turned out to be a barely literate forklift driver who was still with his wife. Oh, he had a record for aggravated assault and theft. He was in a relationship with another woman who was pregnant with his child the whole time. I know of three women that he had relationships with whilst with me. Everything was a game to him. I don't think he had one sincere bone in his body. It's no secret for middle-aged women that it's very hard dating world out there. And if you reach 40 and you haven't met someone, you're very unlikely to. So the only option is to go online. My online dating profile would have talked about the fact that I love my work as a journalist and a writer and I was looking for someone who was honest and sincere and decent with some intelligence and wit. The man of my story, I'm going to call Joe, his online dating profile presented him as a gentleman farmer who split his time between the city in a house on Sydney Harbour and a small farm in the country where he was growing an unusual variety of sheep and regenerating native grasses. We met and I spent 14 months of my life with him. I fell in love with Joe, but his whole life was a fabrication. I mean, I knew of con artists in the financial world, of course, but I'd never heard of romantic fantasists. This guy didn't want money from me. I don't think he, it was for the sex. Like, who does this? When I realised the extent of his lies, I started to Google, and the keywords I was Googling were pathological liar and boyfriend. What came up was narcissistic personality disorder. At that point, I thought I needed to talk to some experts. I discovered that almost nothing he said about himself was true. That in fact, he'd, he'd created this completely false persona. What is it about this sort of behaviour? There's a number of categories that this could fall into diagnostically. So the one that we might most think of would be a narcissistic personality disorder, which is all about using other people to prop up one's own sense of importance, self-importance. How much have dating apps contributed to, to this problem? It's certainly not the only way that this happens, but it makes it easier in terms of access, um, in terms of uh, running a variety of relationships in parallel, in terms of photoshopping and creating personas. You can do that online very, very easily. The relationship with Joe ended at the end of 2015, and it was a year and a half before I sat down and started to think about writing for it. Writing the book really helped me understand what had happened. When the book came out in 2019, I got messages from hundreds of people, long, heartfelt messages, pouring out their stories, mostly from women, mostly about heterosexual relationships, for the diagnosis of narcissistic personality disorder, more men are um, diagnosed with it than, than women. It doesn't mean that women won't do it, but it certainly seems disproportionate that it's going to be the other way. Even now, nearly two years later, I'm still getting messages. 
I decided to reach out to some of the women who had contacted me. Hello, how are you? Hi, Stephanie. Good, thank you. My primary hope is that by telling this story, I can warn as many women as possible about this kind of behaviour. So what else did he tell you about himself? It came out from the UK that he was a very successful entrepreneur. He'd left behind a mansion, um, sports cars. He was in the Special Forces. And he'd actually shot someone. I had never known properly what narcissism was. I'd heard of it, but I didn't actually know the depths of what it meant in context of a relationship. What do you think he gets out of it? If it's, it's obviously not money. Adoration. Yeah. I got the impression he loved to be adored. It was his oxygen. To be adored was his oxygen. Women are often asked, well, didn't you realise and why didn't you leave? We tend to look to the victim always in society we, because the perpetrator is a shock to us. We can't even imagine such a person. So we turn our attention to the victim instead. But these women are not foolish or naive. It's not as if they have just blindly stayed. They are being played. They're very actively being played. I couldn't believe how similar the stories were. There is such a playbook of behaviour to the point that now when someone starts to tell me their story, I can go, and then this happened next, right? There's a period at the beginning where the love is just intense and they, they call it love bombing. With Joe, there were dinners out and holding hands across the table and playing with each other's feet under the table and really deep talking, like we were really making a connection, I thought. The heady days of a love affair in its early stages is, is, is intoxicating. Men who are predators have practice might be picking up the vulnerability, the loneliness, um, disappointment in previous relationships. They work out their story and they look for someone who fits with that story. When I met John, I was not married anymore. I hadn't had children and I was unhappy at work and I felt like a failure to be honest. I met John in September 2017. Well, I met him online and he was very quick to want to meet me and, and have a drink. This is the um, online photo from... Oh, he looks quite handsome there, doesn't yeah, he? Yeah, right? Like, yeah. so when I saw him, I was like, oh, he looks mm. quite cheeky, um, fun, mm -hmm. you know, Irish, mm -hmm. love the Irish accent. Yeah. But one of the things that he said to me was, are you okay with dating a man with cancer or somebody that has had cancer? Oh, Lord. Yeah, I mean, what do you say to that? I'm a chartered accountant. My job is to work with facts. Anyone who knows me from work knows that you don't get much past me. I guess being a, like an emotional thing is a little different. He said that he had had brain cancer and that he was in remission. But just after he'd moved in with me, he just said to me that, you know, the cancer is back. And, you know, I, I remember him, like, yeah, crying and just looking down and just not really saying anything. I remember thinking, all these problems that I have, like, that's nothing compared to somebody who's sick, you know, who might not live for another X amount of years who's struggling with their health, you know? And, and, and I felt that, well, I'm in a position that I can help. He started saying he needed this treatment and that treatment, and it just was excessive. 
it was month after month and then one time he asked me for five thousand dollars and i was just like this just does not add up it doesn't make sense he'd take calls fighting with the doctor saying i can't come in i don't have the money and i i just wonder whether he was just talking into the phone he must have been If I had to identify the red flags, I'd say that the, the most screamingly important one is absences. Um, a man that has to be away all the time um, or comes and goes. Right from the very beginning, uh, Joe's story was that he had custody arrangements with his ex-wife. So right from the very start, he was not going to be available one week in two. And I just accepted that. And there were always changes in the custody arrangement whereby he had to run off and pick the kids up when his wife couldn't do it or she'd let him down. <coughs> or there were business meetings or he had to rush off to his farm. And I wouldn't know when I'd see him again. If you have a very time-bound relationship where you meet in small doses, that keeps going for a whole lot longer because it's not interfered with by the domestics of life. You're not watching someone take the bins out or wearing their daggy track pants. What you're seeing all the time is people at their best. When I read Stephanie's book, I wanted to reach out to her, to someone that actually understood what I was going through. I was 19 at the time that um, Peter and I met. Um, I was still living at home. The age gap between us was 19 years. He told me that he had just gone through a divorce. He had kids. So I respected the fact that on those days that he didn't see me, he was spending time with his kids. We would do activities together on the weekends, um, but it was always on a time limit. And I always craved more attention, affection from him because it was so limited. I wanted to see him as much as I could. We went interstate together. We went overseas to Bali a few times. He told me he wanted to marry me. He wanted me to be the mother of his kids. He swept me off my feet. Um, he was charming. He was kind, made me feel safe. We decided to start trying for kids, which meant we weren't using contraception anymore. He came over one night and told me that he had a urine infection and that he wasn't up for anything. And I said, that's fine. We went and had a shower together. And when I looked down, I saw stitches. As soon as I saw these stitches, I thought that he had a vasectomy. I did argue with him and said, how could you do this to me? And he told me that he had got a reversal vasectomy for me, that he didn't know how to tell me previously that he already had one. He sent me a picture of the reversal leaflet saying, see, I promise you, it is that. It's not a vasectomy. It definitely is a reversal. When I had a gut feeling, if I thought that it was a lie and we had an argument about it, he would come up with the best excuse that it just made sense. He was an amazing liar. We tried to have kids for two years and I couldn't get pregnant. When the woman starts to ask questions, there can be a period of gaslighting. And that's when the men go, you're imagining things, you're being stupid, you're going to ruin this if you keep on going on like this. He told me all the time that it was all in my head, that I had issues, that I needed help. I thought that I was definitely crazy. Hi, Hi. how are you? Thank you. Could you see that he was manipulating her? At first, no. But um, a bit after, yeah. 
Brodie kept a journal and Brodie wouldn't tell me things, what was hurting her and things like that, that I actually read the journal to get an understanding of what was going on. Dear diary, been feeling down today, a little each day to be honest. I'm really feeling like no one wants me around anymore. He blames me, which makes me hate myself more than I already do. I feel he doesn't really want to be with me anymore. Just hating life today, really bad. Mm. Do you want to keep reading? No. <laughs> it did get very bad. There was a lot of times I cried because I couldn't help her. There's a few times Brody tried to hurt herself and tried to kill herself. And that was very hard as a mother as well. Just the, the, the damage that these men do is, is breathtaking. I don't think either that we expect that people can lie on such a devastating scale. In my view, it's another arm of domestic abuse. Coercive control definitely can play a part in these relationships. The gaslighting, challenging their sense of reality, their worth, their value. Ultimately, it's about keeping the relationship going and having maximum control. I didn't even know what gaslighting was. Every time it was like, I, I was crazy. I, I can't tell you how many times you would say it's in your head. I was feeling really guilty and to have the, even have these thoughts, you know, to, to think that he might not be telling the truth. Well, it was big year, 2019, I was 40. And so a lot of like friends were 40 as well. So I went to Mudgee on a um, girls weekend. It was lunch, I'd had a fair bit to, to drink, like we all had. Uh, and I guess I just started telling my story and on the left-hand side was a lady who happened to work for Border Control uh, and on the right-hand side was a lady who, um, whose mother had been done by a con man and one of them said to me, is he even here le like legally? Because he's Irish. And that's when the other lady had said to me, it just doesn't sound right, Erin. And so then they decided that they would support me. Like, these are two women I just met. And, and they just said, um, I just... Sorry. I'm just forever grateful for this. I mean, maybe I would have got there on my own, but it, that was the turning point. That, that gave me, you know, the permission. At our two year mark, he said, let's go and start looking for a house. We went through display homes, looking at exactly what we wanted and got a quote for how much the house would cost to build. Then he decided, why don't we move into his investment property, which he told me was occupied by tenants. We spent over $10,000 on furniture and we organised it to be delivered to the house that we we're going to live in. Two days out from being able to start moving and he said, I'm having issues with the tenants. They're not getting out. He said, I need to take them to court. When he did go to the court, he sent me a photo to prove that he was there and he had his name on the board. Everything on my end looked legit, so I didn't ask any further questions. Now, I think a lot of the evidence that he would give me were forged. There'll be a point where the story that you're told, it just doesn't make any sense anymore. And it's important at those points that you start to ask more direct questions. I was with Joe for about 14 months and I didn't see his house in that time. I asked over and over and over again, 
I said, you know, it's really a deal breaker. I need to see your house. And he kept on coming up with reasons why I couldn't see the house. They ranged from my mother staying with me while her floors, floorboards are polished, to the children aren't ready to let anyone else into our little cocoon. Then the excuse changed to, I'm going to renovate the house. It's chaos, you can't come. Finally, he said, come over next Wednesday night and we'll have pizza and ice cream with the kids. Two nights in a row, he cancelled me. The first night, his daughter had forgotten to tell him he had, she had something at the school that she needed to go to. And then the second night, it was cancelled because his dog was sick. He even sent the picture of the vet medicine. And the second night was when I just thought, no, nah, I can't keep doing this, because I was just a mess. I was riddled with anxiety, I was teary, I was barely able to function at work. That was when I realised that there was very little true in what he told me about his life. I sent an email to him a few days later saying it's over. I said, I don't know what sort of fraud you are, but you're not telling me the truth. After that, I didn't ever see him again. Looking back, he was preying on me. He had no intention of any of the things that he was saying. It was all a game for him. It was all completely fun and games. And um, it was, it was so cruel. It was so cruel. When I got back from Mudgy, I was then conscious that I need to find something. I need to ask more questions. I went through his wallet. I found the, the card he uses to catch the train everywhere. And I registered that and that gave me all the information I needed to know around where he had been at what times. I contacted a girlfriend and I just said, I think that that he hasn't, doesn't have cancer and he's been going somewhere else and he's been doing something else with the money. I said, but please, can you just look at it for me and tell me that this is... that I'm not crazy. I reached out to his ex-girlfriend. I said, I've been living with this guy for two and a half years and I think he's, he has been lying to me. Uh, and then she got back to me straight away and said, yep, well, I think we should definitely meet. Uh, here's a comment. And she brought along another lady, Jane, uh, and we exchanged our stories and they had gone through the same thing. And I said to her, I think that I need to go to the police. How much money do you think he got from you? In terms of cash, just for his treatments and that, it would have been about 30 grand, but, you know, when you add in um, rent, uh, holidays, I mean, it could be in excess of $80,000, I'd say. So he was convicted for taking that money by deception. Um, and he chose to plead guilty. Maybe a month later, he was removed from the country back to Ireland. I got an email maybe three weeks after, and he asked me if I had figured out the number. What he was referring to was the number of women he'd been with while he was with me. It became evident, as I heard from other women, that almost always there was another woman or multiple other women involved. After I dumped Joe, the first thing I found was the evidence of the other woman. It was astonishing as we unfolded and unpicked his lies and worked out when he'd been with her and what he told me as an excuse to be away and, and vice versa. I thought, what else is there about this man that I didn't know? And I discovered that he was bankrupt. 
I did a title deed search, which showed me that the house that he said he lived in was owned by his ex-wife. I was able to establish through other sources that he had a fraud-related criminal conviction in his past. I contacted the neighbours where he said his property had been, his little sheep farm, and they'd never heard of him. Deep down, I knew that there was something going on. You know, after being together for four and a half years, I just wanted answers. Something's not right, something doesn't sit right with me. So that night, I didn't tell him I was coming. I went to the house I thought was ours and I saw his car and his wife's car there. It was about 10 o'clock at night. I sat outside his house and I paired his phone from inside his house to my car. I called the last couple of numbers that he had spoken to on the phone. I spoke to one lady and she goes, as far as I'm aware, he's still very married. So there was never any tenants. He actually lived with his wife and kids in the house that we were meant to live in. I know now, if someone's cancelling on you or disappearing for long stretches of time, or if you're becoming a detective in your own relationship, uh, these are signs that are not very good. And if you're not being treated with respect, get out of there. When you're young, you're in love, and someone follows through with all these excuses and evidence to back up their stories, it's very hard to see red flags. When I found out everything, I felt disgusted, I felt disgusting. I didn't have any confidence left, no self-esteem. I was depressed. I went to the doctor to get a check to make sure that I hadn't caught anything. I made the doctor cry, telling her my story while I was there. It's taught me if something doesn't feel right, trust your gut. Don't shut your family out. Don't shut out your friends. I just want to raise awareness to other women, even men, um, that this sort of behaviour needs to be spoken about, that it needs to be called out. Reflecting on it, I, I wish I'd spent a bit more time on myself and um, and with my friends and my family, which I, I did isolate myself from at that time. There's that song, it's Rihanna, Kanye West and Paul McCartney. And one of the lines is, all of my kindness uh, mistaken for weakness. And I just, I carry that line with me now because I am kind, I'm not weak. It's a huge thing to tell your story publicly and to reveal your vulnerabilities publicly. But as I know now, story, telling your own story, sharing your vulnerabilities is one of the most powerful thing, things you can do for other people. Do you think you'll trust again in a relationship? Yeah, I do. You know why? Because I don't want to let some psychotic man rule the, my, the rest of my life. That's not gonna happen. I'll recognise the likes of you 10 miles away next time. But I won't be, I won't be paranoid, I won't be bitter. I, I'm glad you said that because I think I've wondered whether I could ever trust again, but I'll hold your, what you just said as a mantra. Mm -hmm. You deserve it, Stephanie. Anyone who's done, had the wrong thing done by them, it's up to them whether they're gonna let that give, have power over them or not. That's right. And you're entitled to, to be affected, but not forever because, you know, we're good people. Mm. We're good people. When I finished writing my book, I felt stronger than I'd ever felt in my life. And I think that the women who've told me their stories will probably feel the same way after this. 
the strength comes from understanding what has happened, knowing that you weren't responsible, knowing that you're not the only one. It's the men who've gone into these relationships with the intent to manipulate and deceive. I think men need to be held far more accountable for this sort of behaviour. The women haven't done anything wrong. They've just wanted to love and be loved.